communication, people who got married over the wires, and mm -hmm. the legal issues of whether that was binding, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So. Yeah. People think this stuff is new, it's not. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm Karen Bonner. I'm a professor of phenomenological sociology at the University of Waterloo, and mm -hmm. I'm here as a fellow, uh, visiting fellow for this semester. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm Victor Granado from Madrid, from Spain. I'm a visiting fellow here, and I'm working about immigration and human rights in a political philosophy. Mm -hmm. My name is Simone Rowan. I'm uh, interning at the Hannah Arendt Center this year. I studied. Oh, well, I can't see you. Hi. Oh, I'm interning this year at the Hannah Arendt Center. And I studied literature and philosophy. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, I'm Roger Berkowitz. I direct the Hannah Arendt Center here mm -hmm. at Bard. Um, we, uh, as, as many of you know, we had a conference last year on human being in a human age, which Ray Kurzweil and Sherry Truffle and some other people were speaking. Um, and we have uh, been thinking a lot about the question of what um, overcoming or uh, accessing or accessorizing our humanity might mean mm -hmm. um, for Hannah Arendt. This was something she thought was a fait accompli was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and she thought it was something we should not stop because we can't, but we should think about it. And so the center has dedicated itself to becoming a place to think about, um, instead of just letting it happen unthoughtlessly, uh, how to continue to be thoughtful as we become more and more uh, quick in our thinking and technological in our thinking as more and more of the major judgments and decisions about our lives are made by machines instead of humans or human-machine hybrids, if we want to think about it. And um, are there areas, are there ways, are there parts of humanity that we want to in some way wall off from technology, protect? Is that possible? Uh, or how do we in some way uh, protect those parts of the human experience that we might think are valuable as we continue on and improve the rest of them? Mm -hmm. And so these are questions that the center is, is, is pursuing, along with other ones, um, very much influenced by the thinking of Hannah Arendt. Um, mm -hmm. And we're thrilled to be working with uh, Kritika and the philosophy department to, um, to bring you and welcome you here mm -hmm. to, to think with us about that. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored to have you. And uh, I, I think everyone knows um, is it chorus? Chorus. Chorus. Michael Chorus. It's weekly chorus. Chorus. Then we feel at home in the RN Center to be yeah. talking about a, a chorus. <laughs> chorus. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think most people know it, but let me just say, published two um, very interesting, important books. The first uh, was originally titled "Rebuilt: Becoming Part Computer." How, how becoming part computer made me more human and then retitled, Rebuilt, My Journey Back to the Hearing World. I don't know why you retitled it. Was it you or the press? It was, it was the publisher. Yeah. So the publisher wanted the paperback to have a more family-friendly print book. Right. So the hardback had this skull, you know, the cat scan my skull, and this sort of frightening orange color. So for the paperback, they wanted to picture me as a little kid. Okay. Mm. And I just went along with it. And they want a friendlier subtitle, so they renamed it My Journey Back to the Green right. World. It's actually can be quite a bit of trouble in the deaf community. Uh, okay, because, you know, of course, there's all sorts of politics going on. Yes. And this, the title's obvious. Actually, both subtitles have given me trouble, because the, the hard part of the subtitle, having come in part computer being more human, I got a lot of flack at the, about that at Gallo Dead, because they thought I was saying that to be deaf yeah, was not to be human. Okay, but that's not what I meant at all. And the other one was my journey back to the human world, which implied that the deaf world is the inferior world. Yes. So all so I got hit by both subtitles and all sorts of problems. I can imagine. Okay, well the new book, uh, Worldwide Mind, The Coming Integration of Humanity, Machines, and the Internet, is obviously in the zeitgeist about as, about as firmly as we can get. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're very interested in hearing about it. So, 
you're going to talk for a couple of minutes mm -hmm. about some of your thoughts and work, and then we'll have a discussion. Thank you. So Thank you. we are very excited to welcome Michael Cross. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I did a little homework. So, you know, I did a little looking around the website and did a little reading up on how it ran. And I realized that I had no idea where to start reading. So I asked Roger to send me an article to read as a sort of starting point. So he sent me The Conquest of Space and the Stature of Man. Okay. Now, did you know that I'm really fascinated by space exploration? Or did you just kind of pick that because it's about technology? I had an inkling. No, I had no idea. <laughs> um, I, I think most people who are technologists and futurists are interested in space. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, I. I picked this because um, of the works of Arendt that are short and a good introduction to this aspect of her thinking, this is the best one. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a good introduction. Um, I also happen to be reading a book titled Cosmic Evolution. It's actually a NASA book, so I just printed it out, just giving it for free. It's a book called Cultural Evolution. So my thoughts are informed by both of these. So let me ask, have, have you have you read this? Just point, just check it. Okay. So let me just pick out the sentence that really jumped out at me, and we'll use that as the launching point. Okay, so the sentence is let's see, here we go. So it's toward the end. You know, and I don't think the sentence needs a whole lot of contextualizing. A lot of the essay is about the epistemology of science. So it went sort of far afield for one thing about to read this book. But th I want to zero in from the sentence. So sh she says, she's talking about Heisenberg here. Seen from a sufficient distance, the cars in which we travel and which we know we built ourselves will look as though they were, as Heisenberg once put it, as inescapable a part of ourselves as the snail shell is to its occupants. That's, that's kind of interesting, right? We think of our, us and our cars as being very distinct things. But to an alien looking down at space, they might see us in our cars and think, well, these are just kind of the, the carapaces that these creatures crawl around in. They occasionally emerge when we go right back in. <laughs> they live their entire life in these little shells. When they come out of the shell, they're weak and defenseless. So, just to read another sentence there. All our pride in what we can do will disappear into some kind of mutation of the human race. I think here she's talking about the fact of becoming more machine-like and integrating machines into our bodies. So, is fusing with their technology. I think that's what she means. The whole of technology, seen from this point, in fact, no longer appears as the result of a conscious effort to extend man's material powers, but rather as a large-scale biological process. So let me think about large-scale biological process. So seen from a distance, it's possible to look at all the technology on our planet not just as something we move from nature, but as an extension of the natural processes of evolution. So if you think about things like our eyes and our ears and our bones and our muscles, we don't think of these as technologies because they are natural. And yet they are, because they all evolved because they were advantageous to our ancestors in getting things done in the world. So the eye is a technology, the ear is a technology, the mouth, the vocal cords, the musculature. These are all technologies. They are not designed technologies. That's why we don't think of them normally as a technology. But they are nonetheless technologies, and that they are tools that allow our body to get things done. So I'm just suggesting here that the technology, technology like this, is not something separate that it is simply an extension of the evolutionary processes that have been going on on the Earth for billions of years. So, I think that's what Rance is suggesting here. And let me talk about my, my thoughts on that. So, 
And these are thoughts that are formed by my thinking about my third book. Okay, so I began to propose a third book, which would be about, essentially, on the surface I say it's about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. But that's not really what I'm interested in. I'm not really interested in the search. I'm interested in the question of whether minds that have evolved separately from us, would they be completely incomprehensible? Or are there certain ways in which any conscious mind must evolve? In other words, is evolution broadly convergence? Do all plants essentially arrive at the same set of solutions to biological and technological problems? Or are they wildly divergent? Now, the pendulum is kind of swinging back toward convergence. Back in the 80s and 90s, Steve J. Gould argued that evolution was wildly divergent. He said that if you rewound the tape of evolution and start it again, you might end up with a completely different outlook, outcome than human beings. But people are starting to push back against that. People are pointing out, for example, that the eye evolved completely independently in different species that have no relationship to each other. So the octopus eye is broadly very similar to the human eye, but the common ancestor of the human that occupies is much, much earlier. In other words, eyes are so useful that completely different species have evolved. Chlorophyll is so useful that completely different species of plants evolved exactly the same kind of chlorophyll, despite coming from very different places in the evolutionary lineage. So the question that I'm asking is, is the human mind the way we think of it? Is this something that's going to be universal? When we find in the animals, will we find that they think a lot like us? Will they have eyes in a visual system like ours? Will they have brains that are composed of neurons? Which people are starting to argue is highly likely. Because neurons are a very efficient way of transmitting information from cell to cell. The neurons, too, are, are in structure that evolve independently in different species. So we see examples of convergent evolution all over the history of life on planet Earth. Now, we still have the sample size of one, right? So we don't know for sure. But there are at least hints that evolution is as much convergent as divergent. So, if that is the case, then what is the future of human evolution? And a lot of people, including Baker as well, okay, are suggesting that the future of, em of human evolution is for minds to transfer from the substrate of biological hardware into computational hardware. And there are lots of different ways in which people say it could be done. So Kurzweil, for example, says that artificial intelligences will arise and will be so much smarter than us that they will leave us in the dust. And that will be this will be held in this little playpen for a while while the machines go off and explore the universe. Other people say, well, it may be possible to scan the human brain so that it can be uploaded into a silicon substrate where it will then function as a mind. So there's all these different scenarios. So here's the question I've been pondering. If you did such a thing, would that mind be human in the sense that we think of human? with these artificial intelligences or uploaded minds? Would they be people? Or would they be these completely unintelligible kind of intelligences? And I think the salient question is, what is going to make these minds want to do things? Now, let me talk a little bit about wanting. So think for a minute about Two different machines that you both know well. Automobiles and mice. Okay? Now they're both machines in some sense. But when you see a car being crushed up at a car at a, at a junkyard, you know that it doesn't feel any pain. You know that it doesn't feel any sense of its own mind. So you feel no sense of compassion or pity for it. But when you see an animal being injured, you feel shock, horror. Feel, because you know that animal has feelings. And the reason we have feelings is because our brains have evolved these incredibly intricate chemical systems that give us rewards and make us want to go out and get things. So we have in the brain neurochemicals like dopamine, serotonin, 
oxytocin. You know, this neurochemical system is itself a very complex information processing system. People think of a brain as being just a wiring of the neurons, which is true. But there's a whole other system that's interpenetrated with it, which is a chemical processing system, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin, which interpenetrated into meshes with the neural system. And the two systems have this intentionally interlinked feedback loop with each other. What neurons do changes what neurotransmitters do, what neurotransmitters do changes what neurons do. And you really can't pull these apart. So we have something of a grip on how neurons work to transmit and store ideas and intelligence, at least the inklings of an idea. We still don't understand consciousness, but we do know how the brain transmits information through neurons. But we still have only a very vague understanding of the neurochemical system. But we do know things like when you're hungry, that sense of hunger is in part mediated by the way dopamine is changing your neurotransmitter's activity. When you eat, you get the sense of reward. And that's because the dopamine concentrations in your brain are changing. Now, I'm not even going to try to, I mean, I barely understand the complexity of the system. It's very clear that neurochemistry has a great deal to do with what makes us different from cars and computers. Things like dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin, they don't make us want, they don't make us feel, they don't make us hungry, angry, sexually interested, desirous, upset, sad, all those feelings come from neurochemistry. And it seems to me that all these ideas about uploading an AI just have no, they offer no answer to how you make a brain want something. How do you get the equivalent of the brain's dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin reward systems in a silicon substrate? Well, the computer scientists will say, well, we'll just find a way to simulate that. And I mean, I'm not so sure. Okay. Computer science will say, well, we can figure out ways to measure the way dopamine affects neurons and find ways to create digital analogs of that. But my question is, once you've done that and instantiated that in the brain, if you, if you had this sort of simulation of the brain's digital dopamine levels, does that mean that this artificial brain is actually feeling something? Or is it just, are you just looking at numerical simulation? I think this is a really deep question that people just don't have good answers to. This is a lot like the problem of quality. Okay? How do we know what makes you perceive red as opposed to responding to a certain wavelength of color? This is still a very poorly understood kind of problem. So how do we give these silicon brains quality? How do we make them care about things? How do we make them want things? How do we believe them when they say they start? to want things. The computer is saying, I want this. How do you know that's not just because the counter of a certain variable has just exceeded a certain value, which then make the machine say, well, I now want this. So I think these are <coughs> questions that need to get asked in order to answer the question of, are these supported silicon brains going to be human? Well, they want stuff. And what does that mean for them to be wanted? So let me just say a few other things, and then, and then we'll throw, throw things open. Um, that, that actually covers a lot of what I was going to say in, in my notes. Let me just add one more thing. So, so computer science say, well, you can simulate all these brain informational systems, no problem. The problem is that when you look at an individual neuron, you can look at it as a kind of a digital switch, right? It's sort of a natural transistor. You put in all these inputs from its dendrites, and you get one big output, you know, in, 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 in its axon, okay? So you sort of see with that. The problem is that there's all these intricate molecular interactions going on in the membrane of the neuron that have a tremendous amount of influence over how the neuron behaves. Can you model a neuron without modeling all those molecular interactions? Computer scientists will say, sure, you just look at the top of it. 
But maybe that molecular level matters. Maybe that needs to be stimulated too. And then you go down a further level than that. So Roger Penrose has suggested that there are quantum effects in neural structures which change the way neurons behave. And until you can model those quantum effects, you can't predict how the neuron will behave. The problem is that when you get down to the quantum level, it gets essentially impossible to predict what a system will do. You, you start to undertake behavior that to us looks random, actually is random. So it might not be possible, even theoretically, to completely simulate a human brain all the way down to a quantum level. If it is necessary to do that, then we may have no hope of uploading a human brain. So, these are the trophications I want to put, to put on the table. Um, so, one of the examples you talked about earlier was the difference between seeing a car crash and seeing a mouse or an animal injured. Um, and you said that the reason we have empathy or feel or compassion towards the living being versus the artificial being is that we know that they have emotions, so we assume that they have feelings. However, I would argue that we actually know only that they express feelings, and it is by virtue of that effective, um, animate expression of those feelings that we can relate to that being. And so that's why I believe very strongly that in the future, the very line between technology and human beings and the terminology and discourse that separates those two will be completely blended and even um, we will probably get rid of that terminology because the expression of the emotions will be so effective by the integration between human knowledge and the technological manifestations that we will no, no longer be able to tell which one is a more uh, sympathetic or relatable being. Could you comment on that? Well, you're probably a functionalist solution to the problem. Basically, if it acts convincingly enough that it looks like they're doing it, we might as well treat it as if it had feelings. You know, that's pretty much a Skinnerian perspective, that the ultimate interior of the black box that we can't penetrate, we can only see its behavior. I've never found that all that convincing, because I don't just guess. I mean, Technically speaking, I suppose you're right. I mean, when my cat goes and sits right next to his food bowl and stares at me, that takes a look. Okay. I can infer from all the outward signs that he wants to be fed. But I'm also pretty confident that he feels hungry. He feels a sense of urgency and desire. So I'm not content just to stop at that surface layer and say, well, of course, my cat looks like he has feelings, therefore, he must have feelings. I'm pretty convinced that he does have feelings. And part of the reason for that is, is that evolution is very, um, I think I forget the right word, it conserves structures. So a great deal of our genome we share in common with much, much lower animals. I mean, I think, I forget the exact thing, but something like we share 40% of the same genome with bacteria. Okay. So when nature figured out something worked, it just kept using it ahead. So we can pretty easily infer that animals are humans. Because they have the same biochemical machinery that we do. So I have no problem trying to get around that, that functionalist perspective. I'm satisfied that we know that animals have feelings. But will a computer, will that functionalist um, explanation work for a device that does not conserve any of the biochemical adaptations that we have inherited, that just transposes them into an entirely different substrate? I'm not so sure that if it exhibits a convincing stimulation feelings, is it actually feeling those feelings? That's kind of different to the whole David Chalmers zombie territory. Okay. Um, and I just never found that line of thought all that persuasive. So you believe that the organic quality of the organism is essential to it? Consciousness, or whatever you term you want to use. Well, it certainly sounds like I'm saying that, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure yet. Okay, so this is the question that I'm trying to, to sort out for my third book. If, mm -hmm. if humanity evolves from that post biological stage, will we still be human? I still don't know the answer to that question. That's why I think it's so. You know, people like Bill Pelsey would say, 
that I'm basically articulating a carbon chauvinism. I was probably saying it, actually, that if it's not flesh and bone, then it's not worthy of moral consideration. And that may be flat wrong, but the question is, what would it take to, to know that we were wrong? I mean, there's this really interesting, um, you know, Joseph Weisenberg has this great piece in his book. It's, it's one of the few old books back in years that's still worth reading. Um, oh gosh, put some time in. Tell him like, um, the human use of human beings. You know, and, and, anyway, he's, his point is, he, he, he created one of the earliest AI chatbots, Eliza, okay, which is incredibly stupid. You can, you, can, you can Google and actually talk to Eliza. But it's just, you can type stuff at it, and it spits back a canned response, and it sort of takes some syntactic elements of what you wrote. So, so you can say things like, you know, my dad's bugging me, and Eliza will say, tell me more about your family. Okay, and back in, when it came, when Weizenbaum wrote it, like 1968, whatever it was, People are fooled by it. Okay. They say, it really understands me. Leave me alone so I can talk to them. Okay. People really believed it. So in a sense, it actually passed the Turing test. <laughs> as crazy as that sounds. Um, so there's a lot of, you have to take into account, it's a great deal of projection. We project a lot of feelings onto machines. In fact, Sherry Turkle talks about this in really disturbing detail. Yeah. You, know, you can give old people these sort of like hope bots, okay? And they get really attached to them. It understands me, it loves me. You know, and you, you read your person like, oh my God, you know, we're handling these inanimate robots and they're slobbering them. You know? It really shows how extraordinarily gullible we can be. Not only old people. Mm -hmm. You take the computer <laughs> scientists who develop them, who know that there's no feelings in them and mm -hmm. that they are irrational and Mm -hmm. And they can find and have those same feelings of mm -hmm. love and attachment to the machines. Yeah, yeah, which mind. turns Elena's question around in a certain extent, which is how do you know to what extent, you know, do we want to you, you were resisting the functionalism of you mm -hmm. know the of our love for the machine, but to what extent is what we in a sense as humans most act according to mm -hmm. a kind of fun functionalism. Mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. It's such that, yes, we may have the quantum level, we may have the dopamine, we may have the neurochemistry, but a lot of that we want to get rid of when you talk about want and desire. Mm -hmm. What we want is predictability, knowability, faithfulness. Mm -hmm. We want relationships without the, as, you know, the, without the mess, without the difficulty, as Sherry Turkle talks about in her latest book. Mm -hmm. And maybe the life of simulation is actually one we prefer. Mm -hmm. And that's the real danger, is that you could point out the limits of the machines, and people will say, oh no, and then they'll keep mm -hmm. using and going to and preferring the machines over other humans. People are so easily fooled. I mean, there's even neural structures in the brain, but then when we see a smile, or even if mechanical reactors, as if, as if it wasn't, that can be very deeply embedded into our brain, into our brain chemistry. So you, you, you like the, the builder of Kismet, mm -hmm. so just that, and you know, even though I programmed it, I still respond to it as if it was real. So it's not for gullible. It's that there's neural chemistry, which is so easily hijacked. It's made this thing that people be known to me on feeling, and feeling the feelings. So I'd be concerned about this, this function that you, that you suggest, because we project a great deal of our assumptions onto things that we know don't actually compute. Um, so going back to the mouse and the car example, mm -hmm. um, assuming the mouse does have genuine feelings and consciousness, uh, we know that the reason it does is because the mouse evolved through natural selection and those mice who exhibited aversion to being crushed got crushed less, and so they reproduced more. Um, now, I think it's a good question um, whether that same aversion can be created artificially without just making machines that can reproduce and evolve it on their own. Um, and I don't know, but my, my intuition is that there's no physical barrier preventing that sort of aversion from being achieved artificially. And I'm reminded of a short story, and I can't remember who wrote it, but it's called They're Made of Meat. 
Um, and the short story is just this dialogue between two aliens who have discovered humans. And the whole thing is they're made of meat. What do you mean meat? What does the thinking? <laughs> the meat does the thinking. You're not getting it. And they're so baffled <laughs> by how we can have consciousness. Um, they're, they're so baffled by how we can possibly have anything like what they would consider consciousness, mm -hmm. considering that we're made out of meat. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very powerful story, and I, I really feel that there's nothing privileged mm -hmm. about our meat computers. And, um, you know, I think something similar or something superior could be achieved in a silicon computer, or what have you. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would like to agree with you. Um, and, I mean, I hope you're right, because I think the future of the human race may lie in building these kind of machines which could go very far beyond our biological limits. It's just that it's not enough just to make the statement, well, you're not switching you, it's transistor switching you, therefore there is no barrier to making a silicon mine that, is, that has all the quality of, 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 a, of a unit mine. It just seems to me, to do that, you have to leap over all sorts of things that we know about biochemistry. And you are to bring these, leaving those things uncounted, so we need to right. count for them somehow. Um, uh, I guess my question is, we're sticking to sort of this, uh, you know, uh, organic machine, or organic uh, technological human machine sort of distinctions, these like binaries. Um, and so what sort of is your position with regards to the construct of the cyborg, of the, you know, the human, like with human enhancement or robotogenic implants to change you know, the nature of the human, just where does that fall sort of on the spectrum that we're dealing with? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Cyborgs, so right? You know, me being a sort of cyborg. Right. Some so that's why. I, that's yeah, yeah. I, actually, in, 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 my, um, in, in, my, in my trunk, I have um, two actual coke dinner implants. So maybe after lunch, I'll go back to the part of digging that, bring it back so you can actually. See what's in my head. I'll talk about that in your lecture. But, well, okay. So at this point, they really don't challenge that distinction in any really fundamental way. For the simple reason that they don't really intervene with mind as we know. So my cochlear implants, they give my auditory nerves signals that make my brain believe it's hearing. But there's no trickery going on. Because my brain always believes it's going to get it signals from the auditory nerves. It's just that in my case, the signals are electrically triggered rather than mechanically triggered by the motion of the hair cells inside my ear, okay, which, which you know all about. So, you know, for the first six months after I got my implants, everything sounded really weird. I mean, the whole world just sounded totally different. Now, I'll play some slides, by the way, which will give you a sense of, of what I heard the, 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 that, that first month or two. But now, I mean, the, the real challenge for that in those first few months was I didn't really believe I was here. I didn't feel like I was here. But now it feels like I'm here. So that experience basically taught me that if you add something to the peripheral nervous system, it doesn't really challenge that you know, the, the, the primacy of the eye in, in my skull in any truly profound sense. It did it in some superficial senses. So I had to realize, for example, that my head was going to be drilled open, and that a computer chip was going to be installed in it, and that it would give me information in a way that I had never gotten before. And that really shook me up. I had nightmares about that. But those were not nightmares of losing a sense of self. Okay? Those, were, those were nightmares about living in a different body. That, that was about change about them a challenge to a sense of identity. So I'm not sure if I'm really getting at your question, but I think that the point at which cyborg technologies begin to really blur the, the distinction between a human and machine is when they begin to change conscious experience in ways that are more profound than just replacing senses. Okay. Um, in fact, I think we may actually start to cross that boundary in other ways. Antidepressants. Okay. So it's funny because antidepressants were just starting to come in when I was in graduate school. And people were just kind of wrapping their head around that. And so I started hearing about things like people would, some people would just, they would just stop taking deadlines seriously. Okay. 
Because whatever they obtained, the Prozac and the Wellbutrin, they were aware that that money was there. But they just didn't care about it the way they used to. So they were just more casual about turning in paper and money. And I don't really know how the Academy dealt with that, but, but clearly, you know, we have chemicals that do change the way we think about things. So we know that what we think of as our essential personalities is modified pharmaceutical. Of course, we've known that for a long time. You know, alcohol will, will, will change a lot of what you're subjected to experience. Um, but I don't think cyborg technologies yet are poised to really make us rethink about what it means to be human. I just don't think we're at that point historically. Okay. Um, then can I ask uh, the sort of obvious follow-up question then, which would be, um, if we can imagine a world where cyber technologies are at that point, um, does this question of what can and cannot be considered human sort of, does it become more significant or does it sort of lose significance by virtue of this new emergence of a new type of being at that point? Like, I guess that was the, where the whole question was headed in the first place. Well, let me turn that question around on you. Instead of asking whether it would change, I'm asking how would it be, how would it change? Our understanding of what it means to be human? What kind of changes would it make? Well, it would it mean, like, how are people be different? I guess in my little fantasy robo-universe, <laughs> um, there's a whole degree of sort of finitude of accessibility to information and physical movement and perception that can all be radically diminished, or do you diminish or expand it? I'm not entirely sure how to, what I refer to in that context, but you know, the uh, increased in some degree, or to some degree or another, like um, there's a story of Peter Warwick, the cybernetics uh, professor from England, I think, who uh, put the chip in his brain to increase the like the frequency of light, uh, of light waves that he could perceive. Um, and while that's not necessarily a huge example, but things along those sorts are like instant from your mind to the internet sort of access. And uh, some of that sort of, I feel like, would drastically change what it, what humans can and cannot do, or what cyborgs can and cannot do on the ground. And I think that that, well, it's sort of functionalist, but sort of also epistemological. We can't under, like, what, how do we understand our position at the point where the limits that we had previously conceived of as, you know, this is what humans do, uh, start to disappear? in those kind of ways. Well, I'm not sure if you've really started to get at what kind of changes might happen. You know, yeah. I think that until you get down to that nitty gritty, I mean, you mentioned, is, is, is well, like Kevin Warwick, you said? Peter Warwick, I think. Yeah, it? I've heard Kevin Warwick. Maybe it's Kevin Warwick. Maybe there's a different guy in Peter Warwick. I know the last name's Warwick, though. I know that for a certainty. Well, maybe Kevin Warwick, who wrote, actually, I want to say an astoundingly stupid book <laughs> titled I Cyborg. Uh, might be the same work. Can I check and check them quickly to see if this is the same guy? It's on my computer somewhere. Okay, come, come back to us. I'll be in a minute.